I'd like to talk to you about the current situation in China, uh, Mr. Hitton, because in spite of the fact that you uh, say that you have not been there for several years, I believe you have very close connections with uh, China and have stayed very closely in touch with the situation, and that your stay there in the first instance was of sufficient length and uh, intensity and has resulted in a book which is uh, now uh, causing a great stir uh, in this country called, and you pronounce it now, and I'll try it again, Fan Shan. Fan Shan is the word, yes. Fan Shan. And yeah. that book is a documentary of revolution in a Chinese village. And Fan Shan is not the name of the village. I discovered uh, in a conversation with Mr. Hinton this morning. Uh, it means a complete turnover. Is that what it means? That's it's right. A, it's a vernacular word for revolution. Yes, that's right. It means turn the body, literally, but it means really to stand up, you know, to uh, overthrow the existing order and to gain land, livestock, tools, and uh, rights. That's what it means. And this book was based uh, on years uh, spent in China. I think we'd better uh, review that uh, for the audience so they'll know on what grounds you're basing your opinions yeah. of current events. Well, yes, I spent uh, eight years altogether in China. The last period was uh, seven years uh, in a row, seven continuous years. Uh, one of them spent in, in and near this village about which, which the book is written, and the other six spent in uh, teaching f agricultural engineering, that is, the operation of tractors and farm machinery, in the uh, countryside in China. Well, uh, I will not spend much more time on the book directly because I have uh, not had an opportunity to read the book, but I will say that uh, it carries uh, the most glowing recommendations I've ever seen for a book uh, from uh, three people, all of whom uh, are familiar with the scene in China, Dr. Han Su Yin, Edgar Snow, and Felix Green. And uh, now I'd like to get to the situation as it is today in China and get your reaction to what appears to be going on. As a matter of fact, I don't know how we, one can even use that term, because from the standpoint of the average American citizen uh, hearing the news reports, I don't know that one can even say what appears to be going on, because it's quite clear that no one knows what's going on. Well, this is the uh, response of such experts as Ted White and others. Uh, they claim that they really don't know what's happening, and in the same breath, they imply that China has gone mad. Now, if they don't know what's happening, how they know China went mad, I don't know. But uh, in fact, I think it is quite a rational and uh, progressive movement going on in China. But to understand it, you have to understand that there are two main phases of the Chinese Revolution. And the second one has only uh, begun a few years ago. The first phase lasted for 120 years and was only completed a few years ago. Uh, this is the phase that in China they call uh, the democratic revolution, the bourgeois democratic revolution. It is the revolution to break up the feudal system and to free China from foreign control. They call it uh, bourgeois democratic because these goals might have been carried through by uh, some class other than workers and some party other than communists. Uh, a as it was, uh, this revolution since 1921 was led by communists. But the goals were the same, to break up the land system and divide the land among the peasants and to free China from foreign control. Uh, and these uh, goals were accomplished only in the middle 50s of this century. And China then moved into a totally new stage of revolution, the Socialist Revolution. And uh, it is the second wave of the Socialist Revolution that we are seeing now. Well, uh, the first wave you feel started in the middle 50s? Yes, with the uh, cooperative movement in agriculture, uh, which led to communes, and with the buying out of the uh, business and commercial classes, uh, which occurred in 56 and 57. They gave them uh, government bonds in return for their shares, and they still draw 
5% interest on these bonds. Many of these people, former capitalists and uh, owners, are managers and technicians in the factories and businesses they used to own, and at the same time they draw interest on shares uh, that the government gave them in return for their holdings. So these two reforms, the uh, cooperative movement in agriculture and the buying out of private uh, industry and business, uh, were the, was the first great wave of the socialist revolution and made China, in fact, uh, gave China, in fact, a socialist economy. But prior to that, for some f almost 40 years, the communists led a revolution with different goals. The fact that it was communist and that they believed in socialism and eventually communism has confused many people as to the stages of this revolution and as to the fact that uh, the earlier revolution was not a socialist one. Uh, and it's this uh, transition now that China is in. A, a transition in history can't be viewed as uh, one day or one week or one year. This is a decade of transition. And uh, just because they laid a socialist foundation doesn't mean they completed the structure of a socialist civilization. This is a much more complicated thing. In fact, Mao has said that it may take 300 years to really uh, create full-blown socialism in the world. He bases this on the fact that it took uh, two or 300 years for capitalists, that is the bourgeoisie, to overthrow the uh, feudal lords in Europe and uh, really establish a new society. There were many restorations. They cut off the king's head, and a few years later, the king was there again. Uh, this type of seesaw, back and forth uh, movement in history is uh, quite plain to scholars of the past. And when one moves from uh, private enterprise to public enterprise, from capitalism to socialism, or from pre-capitalism to socialism, this is about the biggest change that it's possible for any country to go through in history at any time. And China's right in the middle of it. The whole earlier period uh, only brought China to the threshold of this, and now they're moving on into a new stage. So my interpretation is that it is uh, an internal, comes from the internal development of China, from the fact that her revolution was so successful in the past, that the basic problems of the old period were solved, and uh, reforms of the socialist period uh, were carried through rather easily at first, but led to a great deal of uh, turmoil and resistance as those people who were all for the old period uh, and were in positions of leadership and positions of power uh, disagreed as to how to conduct the struggle in the new period. Uh, in other words, they... Uh, what is the old simile is that uh, you get on the train of history and then you go around a curve and some people fall off. Well, uh, all these people were on the train of history from 1920 till 56 or so, and they carried uh, with the direction quite clear, anti-feudal, anti-imperialist revolution. And then they turned a corner and they started on the road to socialism. And uh, a lot of people began to fall off the train. <laughs> Uh, people who uh, basically were uh, from the Shanghai, Tinsin, uh, middle classes, some of them communists, some of them not communists, uh, people who uh, fully agreed with the original goals of the revolution but uh, disagree as to the uh, present goal. Well, now, what, what is the difference between the two sets of goals? Well, uh, it comes down to, basically, the difference between uh, two classes. The... Uh, there are only two classes that have uh, vied for the leadership of the Chinese Revolution in uh, modern times. This is the, the working class uh, and the uh, bourgeoisie, that is, the industrialists and merchants. Uh, they have uh, uh, vied for leadership of this revolution over many years, and uh, they formed an alliance over many years to carry through the basic uh, stages. But uh, the merchants and industrialists uh, wanted to overthrow the landlords and uh, free China from foreign control in order to build capitalism in China. The communists, who represented workers and peasants, wanted to do the same thing, overthrow the landlords and free China from foreign control in order to build socialism in China. They got together for 30 years uh, to, do the, to lay the groundwork, but once they succeeded, then naturally their ways parted. The uh, merchants and industrialists don't want to build socialism in China, yet they have great social influence. Most of the artists, writers, intellectuals in China come from that class. 
Uh, many of the uh, leading communists come from that class. And many of them are influenced by that class. And uh, in an alliance that lasted for decades, uh, the issues uh, that are coming up now were obscured because they weren't uh, important in those days. Well, were many of them, um, uh, in your interpretation of this, were many of those people actually incorporated into the Communist Party? Oh, so yeah. that from the outside it would have been difficult to uh, make this differentiation? Oh, yes, the, the, and they were sincere communists. Uh, the, uh, they, uh, in terms of the uh, goals of uh, several decades of revolution, they were sincere communist revolutionaries. But really, in their hearts, uh, they uh, are not uh, essentially socialist. As the, as the revolution moved to a new phase, uh, many of them begin to have questions and doubts. Uh, particularly, it particularly shows up in the field of culture. Uh, the ones who, uh, who first uh, brought out this uh, uh, opposition uh, that was the first uh, signal of this culture revolution were in the main writers and artists and people in the cultural field who uh, didn't uh, want to carry through uh, Mao's line in the field of art and culture. And uh, they were all communists of many years standing. But they conducted a rather vigorous and uh, sustained campaign in opposition to Mao's uh, views on literature and art, which were basically the majority views of the communist movement. What were those views in your interpretation? Uh, Mao's views. Yes, Mao's views, with uh, which the, the as if I, I want to be sure I'm understanding yes. you. Uh, your view of the matter is that many of these people uh, who were in the intellectual class, using that in its widest uh, connotation, uh, were in fact communists, but in fact uh, still belonged enough to an older culture so that they were not prepared for and did not approve of certain developments which Mao wished to see. That's uh, right. Yeah. Right. Well, now, what, uh, what were the things they disapproved of and what were the things he wanted? Well, you see, his basic position in literature and art has been clear for a long time, particularly since 1942, when he wrote the essay of the Yenan, at the Yenan Forum on Literature and Art, or he gave the speech, which has become a, a, a writing of Mao's. Uh, he advocated a class position in literature and art that artists and writers should serve workers, peasants, and soldiers, that is, the masses of the Chinese people that they should go among the people, uh, take part in the struggle of people, uh, both in war and in production and in land reform and all of these struggles, and uh, reflect these in their writings and uh, create uh, works that would unite people and help them carry the revolution forward. That now, sounds a little like propaganda. Do you think that's what uh, he meant? Well, art is always... Uh, it's not a question of propaganda. It's a question of uh, who you support, uh, who your heroes are, uh, what class interests you foster, uh, in Mao's view, as long as there are classes, uh, art is never neutral. An artist is never neutral. There's no such thing as a non-political artist or writer or piece of art or piece of writing. Everything is, uh, serves one class or another. So if you don't serve the workers, peasants, and soldiers, you serve somebody else. Now, in the Japanese war, uh, most of these men went along with it because the enemy then was Japan. Uh, conquering China with soldiers uh, shooting people, and the whole country was uh, uh, united to drive the Japanese out of China. And uh, it was clear that if you wanted to free China, you had to uh, write and think and act in such a way as to oppose Japan and liberate China. Now, and the artists, all of these artists went along with that. But after the uh, war and after the land reform and after the China's national independence, China moved to a socialist stage, then they began to put forth a different view. They said that uh, they should no longer serve workers, peasants, and soldiers, that they should uh, serve the whole people. They should write in such a way as to find an echo in the hearts of all men. And they put forth a classical humanist position. This was particularly done by Zhou Yang, the Minister of Culture himself, a communist of many years standing. Now, he said uh, he took a position of all men are brothers and that the love of mankind is the noblest emotion of the artist and so on. Mao had always said that in a class society, you can't love all men. The slave can't love the slave master and the worker can't love the boss and the tenant can't love the landlord. You have to struggle against him. 
and in your in this struggle your art and your literature and your music and whatever will reflect this struggle and uh, the landlord's art and literature will reflect his side of the struggle but you can't straddle this this fence you get to be one side or the other now uh, and so you have this uh, very sharp difference in approach Mao's approach is still the same that in building socialism you have to side with the masses these other men uh, in this socialist phase are withdrawing from this. In fact, they are siding with the bourgeoisie. Uh, their line is uh, the Western, the line of Western literature. A, 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 on the surface, an above-class line. It is the line of, of American artists, really. Uh, we're above all this uh, politics. We write for mankind, you know. This only conceals, in fact, the rule of monopoly and so on. This is the Chinese view of this. So these men are retreating from the, uh, the old position uh, due to new circumstances. And uh, this is uh, simply the uh, tip of an iceberg which, uh, which culture, literature and art and culture are the exposed part of a great iceberg which in fact is a, uh, a whole different class position in both in industry, agriculture, national policy and so on. Yes, well now yeah. you've, you've covered it. Uh, in uh, in the field of the arts, uh, please, uh, will you take it on from there to these other fields that you have mentioned, uh, what the cleavage was? Because, you see, one of the things which confuses, uh, I think, uh, uh, a Western uh, observer is that we've had, you know, people of great goodwill and intelligence have, in fact, gone in and out of Red China. And until this happened, uh, no indication that these trends that you're talking about uh, were there have I ever heard, you see, mm. uh, at this microphone. And uh, yet now that it is beginning to happen, I am asked to believe, uh, and everyone is asked to believe, and, uh, you know, I try to sit at this microphone yeah. as the delegate of our listeners and not sure. just as myself, that this has been a long time in the making and that it was perfectly obvious and that, um, you know, it, almost the implication is why didn't you already know about it? Well, now, uh, I, I really uh, do not feel uh, that, uh, I mean, was this whole thing so submerged uh, that even a reputable uh, outside observer wouldn't have sensed it? Uh, you know, I'd like you to go ahead into mm. the other fields and break mm. it down on the basis of what you think happened, but I would also ultimately like us to get to the place where where you can uh, can shed some light on the fact that this appears to have emerged uh, suddenly to the Western uh, mind. Well, in fact, of course, it didn't emerge suddenly because uh, right from the beginning, right from 49 until the present, there have been uh, four or five very sharp struggles in the field of literature and art, which are a reflection of this basic struggle of which class will lead China. And the first one began over a uh, movie about a, the, beggar, the beggar educator, uh, Lu Xun, I guess his name, no, it wasn't Lu Xun. Uh, it was a, a man who, uh, in history, who collected money to build a school for poor children. And there was a movie celebrating this man that was made while I was still in China in 52 or 3. And uh, it was, uh, it led to a very sharp uh, controversy because, in fact, this man was an agent of the gentry and he started this school to help suppress the Taiping Rebellion in the past. And the uh, Communist Party exposed this, uh, this man as actually being a, an agent of reaction. But the uh, literary and art circles had gone all out to uh, present this man as a hero of the people. And a very sharp struggle arose around this. Later, there was uh, uh, another uh, big argument about literature and art at the time of the uh, Hundred Flowers movement. And uh, later, uh, again, there was a struggle when, after the first socialist reforms. And uh, for four years, uh, three Peking newspapers carried on a, a, a running battle with, uh, with Mao and other party leaders about the direction of uh, literature and art. Uh, all of these... Uh, all of these uh, should have been signs to anyone that there was uh, such a struggle going on. Now, yeah, but I it myself, was uh, one was led to believe that it was a few intellectuals and that it had really nothing um, to do with the basic 
uh, Chinese revolution, I think, at least. Uh, you see, what, what well. I'm uh, driving at is that the sudden eruption, uh, according uh -huh. to uh, the popular view of it, uh, of the Red Guards and, and the, uh, the whole changeover, uh, does not uh, sort of tally with what people were telling one about how well things were going in the communes and oh, well, in this, but, that, but you and the see, other. But, but this Is thing, that the reason for it? Was this thing arises well. because things have gone so well, not I see. because well, things are going a, badly. A, it's because, as I tried to say at the beginning, it's because the first stage of the revolution was completed in very fine shape. They did do uh, break up the gentry system. Everyone did get land. China did stand up. Foreigners were thrown out. China became an independent, strong, modern nation. And uh, then they moved into a new period. Now, as they moved into a new period, uh, the reforms went well, too. The collectivization of farming went well. The buying out of the, gen of the businessmen went well. And uh, China's economy, after three or four years of tough times in the... Uh, well, in 59, 60, and 61, uh, developed uh, steadily in the last few years. And China is now at the peak of prosperity that she has ever been. But it is just this that has uh, brought all these issues out into the open. In times of trial and crisis, uh, the, the uh, antagonism is muted because people are concentrating on uh, recovering from crop failure and so on. But now, in this period of prosperity, the antagonism has broken into the open. Now, I personally uh, expected that th these issues would have been fought out in the late 50s when the basic socialist reforms were undertaken. But uh, it wasn't fought out then. Uh, I think this was an oversimplified view of mine. I felt that as soon as you change the economic base that you should get reverberations throughout the culture and the society. Well, it just uh, didn't happen that way. There were reverberations, but they weren't very major. Now the, the real struggle has uh, come out as to, uh, as to this. And of course, a contributing uh, factor is that uh, this young generation that is, the main, uh, that is carrying on the struggle in the main uh, is the first generation of worker and peasant students that China has produced. Uh, they are, it's 17 years now since the uh, establishment of the People's Republic. And in the past, these young people never got an education. Now you have millions of students at the university level who were born in peasant and worker homes. And uh, it is on this generation that Mao and his supporters are relying to carry through the socialist revolution to completion. And... Uh, they are the ones who see uh, most clearly and feel most clearly the, uh, the weaknesses of, uh, of a society in which the base is socialist, but in many ways the culture, the politics, and everything else are still new democratic in form, still treating the bourgeoisie as an ally, still uh, carrying out uh, many bourgeois forms of thinking and acting and writing and so on. And uh, here, the struggle becomes very sharp. Let's carry it on then into another field. You did uh, state what you felt the cleavage was at the cultural level between the uh, intellectuals and uh, Mao's concept of uh, the artist as the delegate of the uh, farmers, uh, the peasants, uh, and uh, soldiers, and, and workers. Uh, let's take it into uh, the field of politics and industry. Well, the way, uh, what in, in fact, the way it is shaping up, the, those, those uh, leaders uh, in the opposition who are in power, and this is the main object of the struggle of the Red Guards and others, those uh, leaders in, uh, who are in power are those uh, who Mao says are taking the capitalist road. Now, what do they mean by taking the capitalist road? In the main... It isn't that they are consciously advocating private property in the means of production, that, that one should set up uh, and own factories and so on and so forth. What they mean by that is that the policies that these people advocate would bring China back to a class society uh, which would, in fact, be capitalist. Now, these people in their thinking, in the main, are following uh, the Russian position in the world uh, communist movement. And uh, they are advocating, uh, in the economy, for instance, an incentive system for production, which would uh, be, a model, be modeled on the uh, Russian system. 
And the Russians are, in fact, rapidly enlarging their incentive system uh, in a way that uh, China feels is creating new classes in Russia. And uh, they feel that Russia has already taken the capitalist road in this sense. They don't say that Russia is today a capitalist country, but they say that these reforms and this incentive system and the way they divide profits, the whole Lieberm Lieberman economic reforms uh, are taking Russia back to a class society which uh, is essentially capitalist. And these uh, Chinese who advocate the same thing are considered to be men who are taking the capitalist road. They are advocating these same reforms, this same outlook, and they, uh, if they were followed, China would uh, also uh, create uh, a new class of privileged people, and uh, her socialist goals would be uh, uh, undermined, would never be reached. So uh, in, it's reflected in culture in a humanist approach to literature and art. It's reflected in society in an incentive system that allows some people to go far ahead of others and to gain privileges and prerogatives that uh, in fact make them a new class. And uh, in China, they are very much against allowing this to happen. They uh, feel that they should, that is Mao and his supporters feel, that they should uh, rely mainly on political mobilization, on the consciousness of people in building socialism, and uh, that everyone should go up together, that as the living improves, it should improve for all, and there should not be any uh, possibility for certain people to climb on the backs of others into a position of privilege. Now, they don't mean uh, no differences at all in pay and uh, incentives, but they mean that the basic drive should be political and not uh, the, the dollar hung in front of your nose. This uh, reflects itself in a, an argument over the issue of economism. Now, economism was Lenin's word for pork chops trade unionism on the old uh, Sam Gomper's AFL uh, style, uh, really, of course, uh, George Meany's present-day style. Uh, a trade unionism that simply concentrates on wages and hours and has no vision of, uh, uh, certainly not a vision of a different society and not even a vision of uh, workers as a class acting in their interests uh, to uh, influence uh, the whole system. And uh, in, as far as this would apply in a socialist society, it's much the same thing. It's uh, workers and trade unionists and their leaders looking only to immediate uh, physical conditions and not taking into account the whole development in the country and how they may best advance it. This argument is not new either. You see, uh, this argument, wa uh, the question of whether, for instance, certain workers should uh, be allowed to shoot ahead in wages and conditions while the rest of the country is basically poor, has been argued out uh, starting back in the old uh, red areas in uh, Jiangxi back in 1928. And uh, it broke out in 49 in Manchuria soon after the liberation of China. Li Li San, the head of the trade union movement, was uh, demoted at the time for arguing for sharp increases in wages and conditions for workers. Uh, the basis of this is that in a backward country like China, uh, there are just certain islands of very modern industry. And the workers in these uh, islands of modern industry are very productive, of course. Uh, they produce huge quantities of goods. But the prices reflect the backward conditions in the country as a whole. And so these uh, goods produced in these few islands of advanced industry command tremendous wealth on the market. And the workers there are in a position to exert leverage to get some of this wealth that other people aren't in a position to get. And it's been the policy of the communists to say that uh, these workers didn't actually create these islands of modern industry, that uh, the wealth that they produce there should be the property of the whole society and should be invested where most needed and shouldn't be uh, dissipated in uh, the consumption of a few privileged uh, groups. This is uh, basically uh, has been the policy, and today the issue is coming up in the Cultural Revolution in almost the same way. Uh, the opposition to Mao is uh, arguing that uh, these workers should get sharp increases, and uh, they, in fact, uh, in part, in part, have uh, part of their strategy in the Cultural Revolution has been to pay workers big bonuses and high wages all of a sudden in order to win their support in opposition to Mao. 
but in fact, they haven't won any uh, great support. The uh, young uh, Red Guards, who have not or only organized in colleges and schools, but also in industry, have uh, opposed this on the grounds that uh, everyone uh, should basically uh, accept the general level and that they should all go up together. And uh, I think there's no question that this is the idea that appeals to the majority of Chinese. They don't want to see uh, certain people in a privileged position. Of course, there are many selfish people who personally would like to uh, do that, but the great mass movement is against such, uh, such special privilege. And uh, these young Red Guards, are their main drive is against any, any special consideration for people. They think everyone should start with a, a life with, with equal chances, and uh, the whole country should go up together. Well, how does this affect uh, the agricultural uh, situation, the communes and so on? What is your interpretation of, of that scene at the moment? Well, in the uh, communes, the issue is, uh, is uh, really the same, but it takes a different form. In the communes, after all, you have a, a collective which uh, shares, uh, at the end of the year, uh, the total that has been produced there. And uh, a certain amount is set aside for taxes, a certain amount is set aside for the commune as a whole, a certain amount, uh, that is, for investment, a certain amount for investment at brigade and team level, there are three levels in the commune, and a certain amount is consumed then as, as direct income uh, by those uh, working in the commune. Now, the argument there really uh, concerns how much to save for investment and how much to consume currently. And the op again, the opposition is on the side of uh, distributing investment funds for current consumption. This is one of the tactics that they've used to disrupt the Cultural Revolution, at least so it has been reported in the, t uh, in the New York Times and uh, indications of this also in the Peking Review and Chinese sources, that those opposing uh, Mao and this push for equalitarian socialism have, uh, in fact, uh, almost dissolved some communes by... Uh, distributing the investment funds and the reserve funds of the collective and uh, saying, here, take it and, and have a banquet, you know, eat well, live well, and uh, to heck with the future. Now, this line might win, of course, a few people temporarily, but in the long run, it would certainly be rejected by the majority of peasants who for years have uh, seen the advantages of, of uh, saving and investing in common projects and uh, and the way in which this has stabilized their lives and given them some security. How did they arrange it as between communes? Because certainly some of the communes must have been in places uh, where, it, you know, where it was more fertile, where one one commune area would be more prosperous than another automatically. Yes. Was there any yes. equalization as between the uh, rigors that uh, and uh, geography and uh, so on that a, that a place uh, was up against? Basically, the, that is the weakness of any uh, cooperative agriculture that uh, since it is uh, basically dividing what you produce yourself, uh, where you live, uh, if you live on poor land, you, you're, you have uh, some, several strikes against you, and if you live on poor land, you might uh, advance very rapidly. Uh, they good haven't, land, you mean? Oh, I'm sorry. If you live in good land, you would advance rapidly. If you live in poor land, yes. you would uh, have difficulties. And this is one of the weaknesses of the uh, commune uh, movement in terms, or collective farm movement, in terms of advancing to socialism. And it's always been considered a, a less advanced form of organization than uh, state farms and uh, state-owned industry. Uh, one way of equalizing it is for the government to give a special consideration in terms of credit, machinery, technical aid, and so on, to the more backward areas. And this has been done. But there is no uh, real equalization of, of production. That is to say, they don't take from rich areas uh, actual food and grain and so on and give it to poor areas. I suppose you might say uh, through this investment business, they do, in fact, do that. In other words, they... They try to help the, the uh, mountainous, uh, backward, isolated areas more with credit, uh, machinery, technicians, and so on, than they do the, the more advanced. Uh, but this is exactly, uh, this points out one of the issues in this cultural revolution 
because these Lieberman reforms in Russia, in fact, break industry into collectives very similar, similar to communes. And the workers divide the uh, surplus of their own plant, in part, for extra profits. Uh, this puts uh, a worker in an advanced plant with good management in a position to have high wages, whereas another worker in a backward plant with poor management can have low wages, and both are, yet both are doing the same work. And the Chinese feel this is a step backward. This is a step away from socialism, not toward it. This puts uh, industry in the same position as collective farms, where you have uh, this... Uh, this uh, problem of the, of the rich land and the poor land. So now you have the problem of advanced and backward factories in the same way. Uh, so in China, they are proposing a, a road to socialism, which uh, basically uh, allows no one to uh, advance uh, uh, far above or much above the level of the average. And this is true both uh, among farmers and workers, but also with technicians, managers, uh, professors, and so on. This uh, essay that everyone studies, Dr. Norman Bethune, is an essay in praise of a Canadian doctor who died in China of blood poisoning while serving the people without price. He, he made no demands for himself. He simply uh, did uh, what needed to be done, and uh, Mao had uh, praised him as a very heroic individual. Uh, he stands, uh, f in fact, for those highly skilled intellectuals who would serve the revolution without price. Now, the opposition takes the position that uh, specialists must have special conditions, special wages, special salaries, special living conditions, and so on. The uh, Mao and his uh, supporters feel that this is not necessarily a law of human nature that uh, you can have uh, highly skilled uh, and trained professional people who work enthusiastically for socialism without uh, creating a new class uh, out of these people, without giving them such privileges that they, in fact, uh, depart from the ranks of the mass of the people. And in China, in order to ensure this, every uh, technician and every manager works uh, periodically at the bench, at the lowest level. Every officer in the army serves in the ranks uh, several, at least two months a year. Uh, every uh, manager uh, produces at a lathe or whatever it might be that is the productive unit in his shop. And uh, there has been for many years an effort to uh, uh, instill this type of thinking in the, uh, in the uh, leading groups. But some people have not been won. <laughs> That's well, part no, of the opposition. Uh, <laughs> uh, you've referred repeatedly to the opposition, and you've been talking um, in very wide overall cleavages uh, and making it very clear what it is that, that you feel lies at the root of this. But let's narrow the opposition down. Do you, do you feel, on your knowledge of what is going on, that this is a highly organized group? Uh, I mean, what do you think is happening in China? Now, uh, you have indicated that you feel that Mao has the support and will continue to have the support of the mass of the common people. Uh, I'd like you to comment further if you... Uh, know the uh, score on uh, what the chances of the opposition are. You have mm. mentioned two or three things that you feel the opposition is doing. Is this sporadic, individual, mm. small groups? Is it a national opposition? What, mm. you know, what, what uh, is the score on it? Well, in my opinion, there is no a nationwide, overall, organized uh, opposition to Mao's program. There are various and many uh, uh, opposition groups, including people at the highest levels. Uh, there are in the Central Committee those who oppose Mao. There are in provincial and municipal committees, which are the next highest level, a cadre, communists, who oppose Mao. And there are at the lower levels people who oppose Mao. Uh, this cleavage runs throughout society. In the army, there are generals and officers who oppose Mao's position. In the army, by the way, the issues involve, among others, the issue of whether China can stand on her own feet and uh, defend herself basically with her own resources, uh, or whether China must uh, compromise her 
problems with the Soviet Union in order to get aid from Russia uh, in, in, in both the nuclear weapons and in, uh, uh, you know, radar, missiles, and all of this. So uh, there are many other issues that we haven't uh, yes, discussed Yes, I want to go yet. on to the international but, uh, one, but, but I'd like uh, to sort of get yeah. you to round up the, but the there, domestic In other words, in, in most fields, there are those who oppose uh, Mao's position, but I don't think that they represent a uh, sort of a nationwide organized uh, group. Uh, it isn't clear, for instance, at all that Liu Xiaoqi is leading a nationwide opposition to Mao. Our papers have picked him out. He's the president of China and uh, a leading communist for many years. They have sort of picked him out as being the leader of the opposition and Deng Xiaoping, the secretary of the party. And uh, many of our American experts uh, say that the whole higher level of the party opposes Mao's program and that Mao uh, organized these young uh, groups because he didn't have support within the party. Now, this is, uh, this is not valid. This position is not valid at all. It isn't clear that Liu is leading an organized opposition at the higher levels. Uh, what is clear concerning Liu is that he's under sharp criticism for having tried to suppress or, f or for, in effect, having suppressed the student movement when it broke out last summer. He sent work teams to the colleges to lead the student movement, the Red Guard movement. At that time, it was mainly students. And uh, the work teams, in fact, tried to suppress the movement, and they were later withdrawn. And Leo was very sharply criticized for having uh, allowed this to happen. But it isn't clear that he planned it that way or that he did it with uh, malice. Uh, and he is still the president of China, and uh, Dong is still, as far as I know, the secretary of the party. Uh, men who have clearly stood in opposition, like Peng Jun, Zhou Yang, Peng Jun, the mayor of Peking, Zhou Yang, the uh, minister of culture, uh, and uh, their colleagues in the Peking Party Committee, Wu Han and uh, uh, Wen Da and others, they have been removed from office already. Uh, so what I would, uh, more, uh, would see as more probable is that uh, there are in various fields and in various walks of life various degrees of opposition. Uh, and the goal of the Cultural Revolution is to, is to in fact transform everything in the society that doesn't uh, conform with socialist ideas, uh, socialist ideas as Mao envisages them, which is basically an equalitarian type of socialism to transform all of this and, uh, and uh, rebuild the culture and the politics and the civilization based on the socialist base. So that uh, there are varying uh, degrees of resistance to this. For instance, you have those who, who uh, have for 17 years, say, headed a city government. And uh, though their salaries aren't high in relation to workers, uh, they have been able to feather their nest in a, by, you know, they, they control automobiles, uh, transport, they can get theater tickets, they can arrange banquets and eat banquets that the average person wouldn't get. If there's housing, maybe they can get some better housing than somebody else, if they're not strictly honest. Now, uh, up comes from below this uh, great movement to examine all this. And uh, some of these people oppose it because it means they're going to examine me. Uh, here suddenly everyone is uh, questioning whether um, these privileges are valid. And here I've been having these privileges uh, for quite a few years. So I'm opposing this movement. Uh, at the same time, there are plenty of people in power, communists, who are for this movement and uh, feel that it should take place. And in fact, in the committees that are taking over the cities and provinces, there are, uh, for instance, in Shanghai, there was a large group of communists from the Shanghai Party Committee who were part of the Cultural Revolution, uh, taking over the city government and setting up a new one. Uh, there are uh, also uh, a group from the uh, municipal employees who are part of this and taking it over. That doesn't mean they won't be examined for their past records. Just because they're in favor of the movement doesn't mean that they are excused from having to answer uh, for their record. What will happen as the, uh, the thing shakes down is that everyone who has been in power will be examined for his record, his finances, his morals, his basic position, his, uh, his whole record. And from below, not from above. In China, they don't send out an examination commission and an accountant and so on. The people from below do it, and it's done in a mass way. And this isn't the first time it's been done. But this is, the I think, the first time in uh, modern 
well in recent years, or perhaps uh, at any time, that uh, the whole party has been split as to whether it should or should not be done, you see. You have, even at high levels, some who think that, uh, that this movement is wrong. Therefore, there's resistance to being examined. Uh, back in 40, uh, in 48, when my book was written, a movement very similar to this took place. In this particular village that my book describes, the communists had uh, led the movement for about three years, and already in three years there were many abuses uh, had grown up. They were young peasants uh, who were born in the old society, and they were naturally quite selfish, and uh, they didn't know uh, how to uh, lead a democratic village. There had never been such a thing. So some of them took advantage of their position. Some had eight or ten mistresses. Some uh, uh, took better land than, than the people got, and so on. They had a movement just like this, in which the peasants' organizations examined them all, good, bad, and indifferent, and uh, uh, brought them before committees and had them answer for their records. And uh, some were demoted, some were uh, re-elected, some were kicked out of the Communist Party because they couldn't pass the gate of the people. Uh, this type and of did you movement, feel that it was done with, uh, with comparative uh, uh, justice and skill? Uh, yes, uh, I certainly did, yes. Uh, they it tended to be a little too sharp, in fact, <laughs> uh, but uh, because it was so sharp, it really was successful. You see, you have to, to a certain extent, and Mao has written this too, that sometimes to correct a wrong, you have to go too far. By that, it means, you see, people in general are afraid to examine people above them because they fear retaliation. They fear, well, if I criticize him today, supposing he's still the mayor tomorrow, and supposing then I want, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever it might be, an operator's license or uh, a letter of introduction or whatever, and supposing he, he, he remembers that I criticized him and uh, maybe he doesn't give me what I need. So people tend to uh, fear uh, actually attacking those in power. And so uh, they won't do it unless there's a real movement generated uh, in which they are caught up, uh, a movement powerful enough to knock down people who, who, who don't uh, bow their heads, so to speak. So it tends to be sharper and uh, rougher than, it, uh, than you might say ideally it should be, and uh, people are criticized perhaps uh, uh, more ferociously <laughs> than they deserve. On the other hand, if it weren't this way, uh, it would be very difficult to get the movement going. Uh, now we have, for instance, today we have reports Red Guards are, are leading officials through the streets with dunce caps on their heads and so on. Well, I think uh, this shocks us here in America, but I think it's essentially a, a democratic thing. It's, uh, it's democratic when masses of people dare to uh, take officials and criticize them and, and call them to account. And in the ordinary course of things, you really don't dare do it. It's, it's the rare American who dares do it, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and people in other countries with much more feudal, uh, you know, culture still, uh, still uh, going around, uh, even less dare do it. Your view is, I gather, that uh, this is an internal uh, thing, uh, that it has not been dictated by uh, international uh, uh, factors. Uh, there was considerable comment, uh, to begin with at least, about the fact that they were getting China ready for war. How much do you think that the threat that China feels uh, is possible from the outside has affected either the timing or the fact of what you've been describing? Oh, I think that uh, this is essentially an internal development, and it's coming today because uh, these contradictions ripened within China, and the fact of the crisis in Vietnam, the escalation of war, the uh, growing American pressure on China, the break with the Soviet Union, and therefore China's uh, relative isolation and so on, these make the struggle sharper, perhaps because uh, some of these issues in, are, are some of the issues that are involved in the internal struggle, but they are certainly not the source of it. And it is not an effort to prepare China for war in a direct sense. In, in another sense, however, once you have, you have a contradiction arising within the society, you have differences over direction, it is better to settle it through struggle and one side conquer the other than to try to paper it over. In other, what I mean is China will be much stronger emerging from this 
if Mao wins, uh, it'll be a unified, a relatively reunified country again. If the other side would win, I suppose you might say it would be the same. At least the one line would have, uh, uh, have uh, dom be dominant. If they had just tried to paper it over and pretend these differences didn't exist, China would be really uh, much weaker because you would not have a unified uh, uh, drive to socialism and so on. You would have uh, basically two lines struggling quietly uh, rather than openly. You think uh, Mao's going to win? Oh, definitely, yes. I think he already has basically won this uh, thing. The issues have been clarified. The whole younger generation has been mobilized. So he has support throughout the party, throughout the army, throughout uh, uh, among the intellectuals. Uh, he has mobilized the support that he has. And now these groups have uh, established uh, power and they are going to proceed to this examination of, of everyone. Uh, so the basic struggle, I think, is, is already won. Uh, I think that Mao has uh, a great capacity for picking on those issues that do win the support of the majority of Chinese and to inspire them uh, to a vision of a uh, new society that, uh, for which they're willing to struggle and sacrifice and work. And the opposition is exposed in the main as, as people who are essentially selfish and want the selfish, narrow approach to, uh, to building the country and so on. I'd like to um, ask you what you think about the Soviet-China uh, situation in these terms. Uh, it is obvious that if the Chinese feel that the Russians are taking... Um, what would be the more conservative, by their terms, by Mao's terms, the more reactionary line, that there could be great um, hostility between the Soviet uh, Union and uh, China. Do you feel that that cleavage would necessarily follow through in the event of a real international... I mean, uh, in other words, is this a family fight? Uh, uh, they're both socialist countries in, mm -hmm. in, in the last analysis mm -hmm. by, uh, by capitalist standards, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of uh, incentive uh, motivations mm -hmm. being moved yeah. into Russia, regardless uh, mm -hmm. of whichever side uh, comes out uh, in China. And if the Maoist forces win, then this is a more egalitarian uh, version. But mm -hmm. they're both socialist countries. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Uh, the upshot of this would be in the event of a widening of the conflict, for example, in Southeast Asia? Well, I, uh, I think that's a very difficult question because it isn't automatic that uh, China and uh, the Soviet Union would fight together in case of, say, an American uh, a war with the United States in Asia. The way the Russian leaders are now going, I, I say that the, it is conceivable that the uh, they might attack China in, 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 the, in a, a case in which China was already under attack from the United States. Uh, what the reason I say this is that in some instances they have already done this. Uh, take the uh, time of the Sino-Indian border dispute. India, uh, in fact, attacked China, launched a major offensive in October 62, on October 12th, and the Soviet Union criticized China for resisting and gave arms aid to India. Uh, since the Indian Army was quickly defeated and China uh, withdrew right away to her border and even back of it, uh, to the disputed border, let's say, uh, Soviet aid to India has been even greater than it was uh, then. and. Uh, so uh, there have been instances in which the Soviet Union actually helped uh, uh, a country attacking China. The uh, basic issue between them in terms of uh, world affairs is how to handle American uh, pressure, how to handle what they consider American aggression. And uh, their views are uh, uh, diametrically opposed. The Russians are in effect saying that uh, one should uh, play it cool and uh, not provoke trouble and uh, wait for the uh, socialist economies to mature and develop to the point where they uh, outweigh the capitalist economies. That they, in a, in, a, in a certain period of time, with the rate of growth and with the advantages they have, that they will uh, be the dominant economies in the world. 
And at that time, the world situation will be so changed that uh, other countries can free themselves from Western uh, exploitation and influence peacefully even. And that uh, all of this is a, a charted as a course that avoids war. The Chinese feel that this is an illusion, that the West, and particularly the United States, won't give the socialist countries that kind of time to develop their economies uh, to the point of predominance. And that, uh, in the meantime, uh, America is pushing strongly into all the underdeveloped world and uh, making sure that the resources of this world are uh, actually part of the capitalist world market. And that uh, they will, uh, America will pick off, one after the other, uh, the socialist countries unless uh, there is a much more active worldwide resistance to American plans. They therefore advocate national liberation struggle everywhere and they feel that this far from uh, threatening uh, the world with war makes it very difficult for the United States to launch any major war. That insofar as American strength is tied up and cut down and dispersed uh, due to the need to control uh, rebellion everywhere, that this ensures, as much as anything can, that there will not be a, a major world war. So... Uh, yes, but both policies, as you have yeah. described them, are in their different ways aimed at preventing a major world war. Yes, uh, and yet each feels the other is wrong yes, <laughs> in this but policy. but supposing a major <laughs> world war... Uh, uh, Came to came, be. That's, yes. uh, that, is, well, that is the question, that, because I feel yeah. that, it, that this is an... Ex uh, I'm not saying you can answer it, but I mm -hmm. feel that it's a, a, an extremely crucial question, because if anyone, for example, was under a, 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 a definite misapprehension about the result of mm -hmm. this, it might in fact influence mm -hmm. the policy mm -hmm. of governments uh, yeah. as uh, the total misapprehension of what Russia's strength was uh, led uh, uh, governments mm -hmm. uh, to uh, enter into complete misapprehensions mm -hmm. at the time of World War II. Well, then I would add, I would add this, that I, I, I began my remarks by saying if the le present leaders of Russia continue the way they're going, but it seems to me, in looking at the thing, that Russia's basic interests, uh, leaving aside even her socialist interests, her interests as a nation cannot lie uh, in uh, the destruction of China as an ally of the United States. Therefore, I don't think the present leaders uh, will survive many more crises in which America gains strength, that uh, the Russian uh, people will reverse present trends in Russia, and uh, they will uh, move to a more, uh, to a policy closer to that of China. Now, you see, in Vietnam, uh, you have a case where the Russians are, in fact, giving a large quantity of aid at one point. Uh, wh but while they are giving this aid at one point, they are relaxing tensions all around the world. They are trying to make friends with the United States overall while uh, fighting the United States at one point. The Chinese say that this is an insincere and unworkable policy. In fact, if they really wish to force a withdrawal of the United States, they must put pressure on strategically all over the world and confront the United States with problems everywhere so as to take pressure off Vietnam. They, must, uh, they should uh, uh, put pressure on in Germany so as to tie down American troops there. They should put pressure wherever they can to tie down American strength, and uh, both economically, militarily, and uh, politically. Uh, they should uh, support armed struggle in the uh, colonial world and in the underdeveloped world. And this, too, uh, ties down American strength, uh, because all of these armed struggles are countered mainly by, uh, by us, by, by uh, aid from the United States and by direct intervention. Uh, the Chinese say that it, as long as the Russians don't do that, they really don't mean to force the United States out of Vietnam. And, in fact, it's worse than that. Uh, by giving the weapons and... Uh, 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 and uh, creating a situation in which the war there is fought with Russian weapons, they're in a position to dictate the peace. And, uh, in fact, uh, since their overall policy is one of, uh, of uh, compromise and friendship with the United States, uh, they fear a peace dictated on American terms. The, uh, the Chinese, uh, uh, so they oppose the way in which Russia is aiding Vietnam. Uh, they feel that it must be strategic, not simply tactical, at one point. 
Uh, this uh, is the basis for the uh, hard feeling over the whole uh, Vietnam War. Uh, now, as for the, uh, the charges that China has obstructed aid, the, which the Russians have made, uh, both uh, the Chinese and the North Vietnamese have denied this. Uh, they say that China has uh, given every facility to transport arms and uh, aid uh, to Vietnam. But I think that there is some basis uh, for this. Uh, it lies in this, that the Russians have asked China for carte blanche, for planes, for instance, to fly without clearance over China to take uh, material to Vietnam. They have also asked for the same carte blanche in rail shipments. They want to ship without bills of lading, without inspection, uh, just a ship through China, whatever they wish to ship. Now, the Chinese have uh, not given, granted this. If this is obstruction, then they are <laughs> guilty of some obstruction. They have asked for the normal uh, controls that any nation has over shipments across its territory, I suppose because they basically they don't trust the Russians uh, because of the way in which the Russians are handling this thing on a world scale. And uh, from the Russian point of view, this is uh, willful obstruction. Uh, they think uh, China could uh, more greatly facilitate this uh, aid if they would relax some of these normal uh, uh, controls that any country has over shipments in its airspace or over its uh, rails. So there is a, a basis for these uh, charges and countercharges, uh, and uh, the sad fact is that the two countries do not trust one another that much to uh, that, that, that they can. Uh, uh, put their full strength uh, behind uh, Vietnam in this case. Thank you very much for coming in. I've been talking to William Hinton, author of Fan Shang, a documentary of revolution in a Chinese village, who spent many years in Red China and who is now on a lecture tour of the United States talking about the present situation in China. Thank you very much.